welcome to the Fundamentals of Ultrasound Physics lecture series put together by the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Today's lecture is on biosafety and effects. Today, we'll start by talking about acoustic variables and measurement. This is different ways of quantifying how much energy we're putting into the body with ultrasound. The three ways we'll pay attention to are pressure, power, and intensity. After that, we'll talk about different types of bioeffects. They're primarily categorized into thermal effects and mechanical effects. We'll talk about mechanisms of bioeffect production. How do we go from ultrasound getting into the tissue to those thermal and mechanical effects? Then we'll talk about the Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable. Different ways we can reduce the amount of ultrasound we use to achieve our goals. So what do we mean by acoustic output quantities? These are just ways we can look at how much ultrasound we're putting into the tissues. Three ways that we're going to start with are pressure, power, and intensity. Pressure is just a way of measuring the strength of a wave. It's in units of pascals, or millimeters of mercury. Because a pascal is a small unit, usually we use megapascals. Diagnostic ultrasound can get up to 4 megapascals. Let's put that in perspective. Atmospheric pressure, the pressure you're around right now, is 0 0.1 megapascals. So diagnostic ultrasound can get up to 40 times the pressure that we stand around in on a regular basis. That's a lot of pressure, and if you talk to physicists or engineers, they're shocked because that seems like a lot more pressure than you would get in something as benign as ultrasound. We're going to talk more about what effects the large pressures involved in diagnostic ultrasound can have on tissue. Let's imagine that we're looking at the pressure at a specific point in tissue where ultrasound is being applied. Here on the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have pressure. As you can see, it looks like a sine wave. All of the areas where that sine wave is greater than zero that's called the zone of compression. Because the pressure is increased, all of the molecules there are being squished closer together. The area where the pressure is the highest is called the peak positive pressure. As you can see, all of the areas where the pressure is less than zero is the zone of rarefaction. That is where the molecules are being pulled apart. And the lowest part pressure is the peak negative pressure. Those values are important when we consider mechanical effects in tissue, as we'll talk about later. So how do we determine pressure? We use a hydrophone. This is another piezoelectric device not unlike an ultrasound probe. The difference is that it just listens. Sound waves approach the hydrophone and deform the piezoelectric, which creates a charge which is detected by the receiver and calculated back out as a change in pressure. Although pressure tells us many important things about bioeffects, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know. So how about power? Power is the rate of energy transmission into the tissues. We measure it in watts or milliwatts. Ultrasound is generally on the order of 10 milliwatts. How do we measure this? We turn on an ultrasound probe in a bath of water, and we leave it around an analytic balance, a very sensitive way to measure force. The ultrasound exerts a force on the balance, and from this we can calculate how much power is being consumed. Still, even power doesn't tell us everything we need to know. So here's another quantity we use, intensity which is essentially power per unit area. The units are milliwatts divided by area. Depending on how you talk about intensity, and we'll describe different ways to talk about intensity on the next slide, it has a lot of advantages over power. One thing is it can tell us more about some spatial considerations than power can. Consider a large abdominal curvilinear probe and a very small vascular small parts probe. If you use both of those probes, 
with the same amount of power, although the same amount of total energy is getting into the tissues, it's distributed very differently. The curvilinear probe is much larger, and so that power would be spread out much thinner. On the other hand, that small parts probe would have a lot more energy in a certain specific area than the curvilinear probe. It can also tell us something about temporal concerns, depending on which intensity we're talking about. Temporal concerns are basically talking about the shape of the pulse, or the time period over which the ultrasound is on. If you'll recall, the time period is basically the duty factor. What percentage of the time is the ultrasound on? We use a variety of acronyms to describe intensity. One description is the spatial description. Here we use SA for spatial average or SP for spatial peak. Across the ultrasound beam, the value of the intensity will change depending on how near or far you are away from the focus. As you can kind of imagine, near the focus, the intensity will be higher as the ultrasound is distributed over a smaller area. In the deep far field, the intensity may be lower as the ultrasound has been attenuated and is distributed over a much larger area. So spatial average gives you the intensity over the entirety of the probe surface or the beam width, whereas spatial peak gives you the value for intensity at the highest point anywhere within the ultrasound beam. The other set of acronyms describing intensity talk about the time portion. Here we use three different acronyms. TA for time average, PA for pulse average, and TP for temporal peak. The time average is intensity averaged over the entire time the probe is on. Because duty factors are usually low, this number will be very low. The pulse average averages only over the time the probe is emitting ultrasound. This number will be significantly higher than the time average. However, recall that even over the course of a pulse, the amount of ultrasound emitted changes throughout the pulse. So that leads us to temporal peak, which is the highest intensity that you see any time during the pulse. What does that look like? Well here we have a sample ultrasound pulse. You can see peak compression and peak rarefaction there. Below is the graph for the intensity of that wave. The intensity is all positive because it's a magnitude. It doesn't really have a negative intensity. Now you can see labeled ITP, which is the temporal peak intensity. Below that you can see a graph of what the pulse average intensity looks like. Again, it's zero when the pulse is not on, and then shows you a number significantly higher when the ultrasound is pulsing. Here you see the time average intensity, which is not much above zero, because you're averaging that intensity down over the entire time the probe is on. So let's put this all together. Using both a spatial and a temporal component, you can describe intensity several ways, including SATA, spatial average, time average intensity. That's intensity average over all time and over the, all of the transducer surface. This is always the lowest intensity that you can talk about. You can also talk about the SPTA, the spatial peak time average intensity. This is the intensity that is the highest across the entire beam averaged over time. This number is sometimes useful in discussing thermal effects. Continuing, we can discuss the SPPA, the spatial peak pulse average intensity. Now again, this would be describing the highest intensity across the beam averaged over the time that the ultrasound machine is actually emitting ultrasound. 
And finally, we can talk about spatial peak, temporal peak intensity. This is the highest intensity number that we can talk about because we're using both the highest spatial number as well as the highest temporal number. Of note, the SPPA, spatial peak, pulse average intensity, is associated somehow with cavitation.